Welcome to week 20 of the Objectivism Book Study. I'm Cody Leibolt, and we are beginning chapter 7 in Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand by Leonard Peikoff. We are looking this week at pages 206 to 213. So this week's reading is on the basics of value. We're going to ground the concept of value in the concept of life, the idea that living beings are goal-directed and that they're capable of dying. We're going to relate the idea of value to several other important ideas. There's material in this reading about the immortal robot argument from Ayn Rand. Now, this is an argument that I find somewhat illuminating, but perhaps worthy of critique. I think there is going to be a lot of work to do in this reading this week to make it clear where Christians might agree or disagree with parts of Ayn Rand's argument. So I want to say up front that the most important thing in this material is the definitions and the conclusions about how to think about what value is. I think that on the issue of the definitions and on the conclusions, we can come away as Christians saying, this is profound, this is not something that most people have thought about, and this is defensible. And from the Christian point of view, it's easily accepted. We can compare what Rand is saying about value to what the Bible assumes about value, wherever it does bring up the material. In the last two pages of the reading, there are going to be some things that are particularly challenging, and I'm actually going to suggest that we read the last two pages, starting from the very end and moving backward a little bit, because this whole presentation that Leonard Peikoff makes, in a way it almost sounds like he's unwinding his premises, starting from conclusions to what is the premise on which it's built, and moving backward. And so I found that if I read it one direction, it was one sort of presentation, and if I read it the other direction, it was a different sort of presentation. So, I mean, I would, I would recommend reading in both directions just to see what all is he doing here. It reads like he had a challenge in figuring out how he wanted to present what he's presenting. Divide the reading this week into a few different parts. Page 206 to 209 would be the intro. This is the terms. This would be the part that we could accept without too much controversy because Ayn Rand just points out some of the terms here. Then we get to the next section, bottom of 209 to the top of 211 is the immortal robot, which we'll interact with critically. Then when you get to 211 to 213, that's where we're in the section where we're trying to relate these terms, life, value, and reality. And Peikoff makes this point that the idea of value arises in the context of a living being that is within reality. And so if you're going to try to ask yourself questions like, why should we value life? Then you become incoherent because we are living beings that use our minds to ask questions like should and we ask that kind of question in the context of being a living being that is seeking to stay within reality that's the only reason why we have this process of asking questions like should or what is true so you go to ask questions about what is or what should be as a living being while dropping the context of where did that process come from then you become incoherent. I think that's the kind of argument that he's making, but it's a little bit of a difficult argument to explain. It almost reminds me of a transcendental argument. Since we're just starting out, we would call this the prolegomena of ethics. We might call it meta-ethics. Another term that you might be familiar with is axiology. We are here in the meta-ethics. We're talking about what are the starting points of even having an ethical theory. So Peikoff writes metaphysics and epistemology like the natural sciences are factual subjects. So he would differentiate between those subjects that are strictly factual versus those subjects that are value oriented. He says ethics or morality is an evaluative subject. Its concern is not only to describe it, also to prescribe. Now the objectives are going to come to the conclusion that you actually can prescribe based on what you observe of the plain old facts, but they do differentiate between the things that are just plain old facts versus the things that are, I would, I would call them moral facts. So Peikoff writes that in Ayn Rand's words, ethics provides a code of values to guide man's choices and actions. This concept of a code is going to be important. A code of values. Now, if you were to ask yourself, why do we, why do we need to have the idea of right and wrong? And, and then what is right and wrong? You would follow the same kind of pattern that Ayn Rand followed, which is she says, okay, well, what facts of reality give rise to the need for this concept? And so the concept of right and wrong actually amounts to a code, a system of approaching the question of what kind of actions you want to take over the course of your life. And a code of values, is like a rule book, a playbook. So why do we have a playbook? That's what she's starting to ask. Peikoff writes, according to objectivism, 
this code must deal with three basic interrelated questions. This is quite helpful and worth really thinking about and memorizing is in objectivism, a code requires that you answer three separate questions. For what end should a man live? What is his end? By what fundamental principle should he act in order to achieve this end? So we have now the end and we have the principle. And then last, who should profit from his actions? So that that's the who. So we have end, principle, and who. And another way of looking at those three questions would be to say, what is the ultimate value? That's the first part. And then what is the primary virtue? That's the second part. And then who is the particular beneficiary? That's the third part. So I think that's actually easier to memorize is value, virtue, and beneficiary. Those are the three questions that according to Peikoff and Rand, we must answer. Now they summarize their position on these three questions. They would say that the ultimate value is life. They'd say that the primary virtue is rationality. The proper beneficiary is oneself. And they think that this question of the beneficiary is actually pretty easy to answer once you've established the other two issues. Now, as a Christian who has thought about this quite a bit, it's something that does not seem on just, just on face value to be what we hear in the church all the time. We do hear many places in the Bible where Jesus would say, you know, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you may have life. You may have it abundantly, John 10, 10. We hear passages in the Bible about, you know, what good would it do for a man if you were to gain the whole world, but to lose his soul? Well, that's Mark eight thirty six. Matthew 16, 25, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you pay attention to what most preachers say most of the time, you would come away thinking, okay, so self-sacrifice is good. At our YouTube channel, we've discussed a lot this idea of David Platt's death to self, this idea of mission is the opposite of self, according to Ed Stetzer. The big Eva trend for the last 10 or more years has been self-sacrifice, radical altruism, otherism, pathological altruism. And so when I go and I look at this, I think, okay, what Rand and Peikoff are saying is the opposite of what big Eva says, but what does the Bible say? And I think the Bible doesn't sit us down and say, this is the foundation of ethical theory, but it does say, choose you this day whom you'll serve. I set before you life or death. And so there is in the Bible, this constant ethos of valuing your life and using the value of your life as the criteria by which you choose how you're going to live. So that, I mean, that's in the old Testament, that's in the new Testament that summarizes the objectivist position. Life is the ultimate value and the beneficiary is the individual the principle by which we seek life is rationality so go to the top of page 207 peacock starts asking the questions that we need to bring us into this field how can facts any or all of them lead logically to estimates such as good or evil right or wrong desirable or undesirable how can a knowledge of what is validate a conclusion stating what ought to be he says, for centuries, since the atrophy of the religious approach to philosophy, the consensus among ethicists has been that these questions are unanswerable. Ethics, according to the received wisdom, is arbitrary. So you can see, historically, we had a, a pattern of religion saying that it had the monopoly on this issue. And in some cases, people like Dostoevsky would say, well, we have to have a religion in order to know right and wrong. And once there is no religion, then people can do whatever they want. That's, that's what a lot of people thought around the 1800s. And so some of the people were clinging on to religion and saying, we need to have a belief in right and wrong. So therefore we need to have religion. Now, this is a backward argument. If you're familiar with Romans one, Romans one and the rest of the Bible make it clear that people know right and wrong based on just observation from reality. But unfortunately, many times Christians have not understood Christianity and that's still true to this day. I was just having a discussion this morning with somebody about how uh, Romans one actually tells us even pagans have access to moral facts from reality. And that's what it says in Romans 120. The things are understood from what has been made. You can review that. Comments before we move forward in the discussion. I think on the question of 
why we would think we can get an is from an ought, it's helpful to just rhetorically think, where else would you get an ought? From that which is not? If morality exists, and most people would affirm that it does, then it has to come from reality. And there's no reason that we should think that it would have to come from unreality, from that which is not, that it would have to be some arbitrary edict separated from reality. And then we could get into questions about how that relates to God's commands and things like that, Cody, if, if you think that would be helpful, or other objections that people might have. But at the end of the day, you can't have morality coming from nothing you can't have anything coming from nothing so it makes perfect sense that you would get oughts from ises if there are oughts at all david hume and the skeptics throughout history have had this sort of they've posed this question this challenge how do you go from the is to the ought and this is one of ayn rand's best contributions to philosophy is explaining how you can do that I would also point out, though, that she's not alone in this, that John Locke thought that you can move from an is to an ought. He thought that morality was something that could be treated like a science, something that you could, because of the advancement of human knowledge, philosophical knowledge, we get to the point where we actually know what right and wrong are based on our observations and our reasoning about it. You could also find that in the common sense realism school, like Thomas Reed. And to some extent, any important thinker throughout history is operated as if this were the case. So Peikoff, he writes in the middle of 207, as the name suggests, objectivism denies the denial of morality. In other words, objectivism believes that values are objective, not just that human knowledge is such, but values, knowledge about values can be objective. He says, what ought to be can be validated objectively. Ethics is a human necessity and a science, not a playground for mystics or skeptics. So he wants to explain his position. So we go to the next section in the reading. The heading is life as the essential root of value. The key to an understanding of ethics lies in its central concept value. So the theory of objectivism on how you ground your knowledge of anything is that you ask what facts of reality give rise to the need for this concept? What facts of reality give rise to the human need for this concept? And in this case, we're saying, okay, well, we have this concept of value. We've learned it from other people. We've, we've known it since we were young kids. We've been told this is good, this is bad. Well, what does that mean? What, what do the adults in our life mean when they use that term? So then Peikoff says, the first question is not to ask, what values should a man accept, but rather does man need to judge and select values at all? Is morality necessary or not? And if it is, why? So is a code of values necessary for man to live? And this is more of a scientific question. You can look and you can say, what, what happens when people have code of values, a code of conduct, and what happens when they don't? And so is there a connection? We're asking if there is an observable connection between people following a code of values and then living successfully versus dying young. To answer this question, one must know what the concept of value denotes. And so go to the next page. Like every concept, value is reached and defined on the basis of observation. The crucial datum here is the fact of goal-directed action. So this is the point that is, I think, fairly unique within Rand, or at least it's uniquely clear within Rand. Rand defines value as that which one acts to gain or keep. So we observe. Now, we're not making evaluations yet. We just simply observe that living beings take actions in order to gain certain things or to keep them if they're in danger of being taken away from them. And so this is a fairly open-ended idea. If value is just that which living beings are acting to gain or to keep, we're not yet evaluating whether they've selected their goals correctly. Could very well be that there would be a person or an animal that would seek to gain and keep something and that that thing would actually kill it. Say that there was meat that had gone bad and the dog fights off all the other dogs for that meat and then he eats the meat and then it hurts him do we say that that meat is a value to the dog 
The objectivist answer on this is a little bit complicated, but I'll tell you the first level of the answer is that if the dog has been acting to gain or to keep that thing, then that dog is valuing that thing, treating it like it's a value. The dog is deciding that this is a value. And so on Rand's very broad definition of value here, yes, that meat, even if it's harmful, that meat has been selected as a value. It is what that animal was acting to gain or to keep. So uh, this is what Peacock says. Value denotes the object of an action. It is that which some entity's action is directed to acquiring or preserving. We're not asking about what it should, but simply what does preserve. It's open as a concept. So then Rand writes, value presupposes an answer to the question of value to whom and for what? So if you were to ask yourself, do rocks have values or do robots have values? Well, no, a value only is something that can apply. It's the fact that the entity acts and, and takes actions that result in it gaining or keeping that. You might be able to make a case that plants have values, but I'm not sure. I think Rand and Peikoff are arguing that they do. I think they would say that values pertain to living organisms, which would include plants, and that the distinction between man and plants and animals is that man has the capacity to choose, whereas animals and plants don't. It's driven by instinct or automatic mechanistic processes. It presupposes an entity capable of acting to achieve a goal in the face of an alternative. So in the sense of like plants that are, that are growing in the soil, the alternative is just that the plant will either succeed or fail in its growing. The plant is not making choices using its mind about which direction its roots should go. Not even in the same sense that a dog is going to make a choice about which meat it wants to try to grab for itself. The dog actually does make a choice plant doesn't. But in either case, there is an alternative that is being faced. And the alternative sets the context for this idea of value. The alternative is either that the plant could live or die or that the dog could live or die. They write, where no alternative exists, no goals and no values are possible. If you skip to the next section, an object is outside the field of value if action in relation to it is inapplicable or necessarily ineffectual. I think this is a pretty easy point to understand. If one is guaranteed to have a certain thing or not to have it, no matter what one's actions, then the thing is not an object that one acts to gain or keep. So this is how they are defining value. They're saying if it's something that you must act to gain and keep, then it is a value. If, if there's no alternative possible, then there is no sense in which we would say that this is a value. Top of 209, the concept of value presupposes an entity capable of generating action toward an object, an object that requires action if it is to be attained. Now, so far, I'm in agreement with these ideas. Living organisms, we see in the middle of 209, living organisms are the entities that make value possible. Yes, I agree with that. They are the entities capable of self-generated, goal-directed action. Yes, I agree with that. And then the next part says, because they are the conditional entities which face the alternative of life and death. Let me read the whole thing, and it'll become more clear what his point is. Living organisms are the entities that make value possible. They are the entities capable of self-generated, goal-directed action. Because they are the conditional entities which face the alternative of life or death. Now that's interesting, because I'm not sure that on, on a Christian view of the way the universe is, in, including god i'm not sure that that's going to apply i think that peacock is making a slight move uh here that is almost imperceptible he begins with the premise that a value is that which one acts to gain or keep but here where, where he makes this turn and inserts this clause because they are conditional entities capable of life or death at that point, he is moving from gain or keep to keep exclusively. Th think about it. Uh, uh, we can agree a value is that which one acts to gain or to keep. 
but you do not need to be capable of death in order to act to gain something. To gain something doesn't require the context of being able to die. To keep something does, right? To stay alive, to keep your life. But to, if, if you remove the context of being able to die and needing to keep something, there's still the possibility of needing to act to gain something. And it's like Peikoff is dropping that gain aspect of value here and focusing exclusively on the keep aspect in order to argue that values presuppose the alternative between life and death. Does that make sense? Yes, I've been thinking the same thing. And one way that I've thought about it is can angels experience joy or suffering, pleasure or pain? And if so, if angels are immortal beings and so if they are capable of experiencing either, say, pleasure or pain, then wouldn't it be true that experience of pain, that would be a disvalue? Existing in an experience of joy or pleasure would be a value. And so what Peikoff is doing, I think he's looking at all the instances of life that he's observed, and he's talking about biological life. And he's saying that there's no biological life where these ideas are separated, the idea of pain or suffering and death being separated. Those, those are necessarily connected in biological life, but he's not looking at other possibilities. Yeah, I, I think there's a little bit more to it there though. So one, you don't have to bring in the supernatural in order to make this point. You, you could project uh, technological advances where man is functionally immortal through medical and technological advances and think, would we then be valueless? No, because th there are things that you could still act to gain that it would be a loss not to gain them, right? So you act to gain, or you, you act to thrive in X respect where it, it requires effort to thrive in that respect, whatever it is, right? And if you choose not to act in that way, or you fail to act in that way, you, you don't thrive in the way that, that you're talking about. So you don't even have to bring in the supernatural aspect of it there. So you would think about it more in terms of extending the range of your action. There are certain things in life that you can do that are enjoyable to do, things that you consider to be worth doing, and they don't all amount to protecting myself from dying. Exactly. In fact, that's most of the valuable things that we have in human life. I mean, you have to get past the point of bare subsistence, uh, of you know bare survival. But once you get past that point, there's an infinite realm of joy and pleasure and adventure and value to be explored whether or not you've got the possibility of dying. So we're disagreeing with his next sentence because his next sentence is, they are thus the only kinds of entities that can and must pursue values. What he means there is conditional entities. Entities that face the alternative of life or death are thus the only kind of entities that can and must pursue values. Now, just taking a Christian look at this, can God pursue values? Can angels pursue values? And are, do they face an alternative of life or death? So we'll have more to say about that as we move forward. There is, Ayn Rand writes, only one fundamental alternative in the universe, existence or non-existence, and it pertains to a single class of entities, to living organisms. And then we see the alternative of existence or non-existence is the precondition of all values. It's an extraordinarily broad claim. I mean, if the entity didn't exist, it could not pursue values. Granted, uh, his next sentence is, if an entity were not confronted by this alternative, it could not pursue goals, not of any kind. I think this is where I would disagree with him. Yes. Yeah, so, so what you just said, where it's true that if the entity doesn't exist, it can't pursue any values. He explicitly says at the very end of this section on 213, that that's not what he means. So uh, I think you're right. What, what he says next is, is really what he's getting at. And that's what I'm disagreeing with. 
So that's the introduction section of this material. And this next part is where he introduces the idea of the immortal robot. So now we're on part two of three of this reading. Rand gives this example of an immortal robot, a robot not facing the alternative of life or death, requires no action to sustain itself. It is an entity which moves and acts, but which cannot be affected by anything. Can't be damaged, injured, or destroyed. Okay, so if there were such a thing, then what are the implications? Now, it's interesting because she's positing this idea of something that is indestructible. And we as Christians might think, well, God is similar to this in that he's indestructible. But she's also made him a robot. She hasn't made it a him at all. She's made it an it. A robot doesn't have a consciousness, as far as we know. Once we remove the alternative of life or death, we remove the possibility of need satisfaction or need frustration. Now, I'm just not in agreement with that. You could have a need for joy. Now, if, if all they're saying is that within the biological context, joy is connected to our survival need, well, that is true. But I don't think that's all they're saying here. So they go on, we thereby remove also the sensory incentives, the, the pleasure or pain sensations which accompany need satisfaction or frustration. They go on, so can abstract knowledge be a value? What for? Is money a value? What for? To buy what? Is having the love of friends a value to it? This begs the question, friends are men who share the same values. In order to have a friend, one must first hold some values. Happiness is the emotion which proceeds from the achievement of one's values. It presupposes that one holds values. Now, it looks to me like they're doing something here that is circular, or there may be some question begging going on here. In the discussion here at the bottom of the page, we read, on both the physical and the psychological levels, this entity would be passive, unconcerned, uninterested. I'm not sure why it would follow that any being that is not capable of dying would therefore be disinterested. You may be familiar with The Watchmen. It's a comic book, it's a movie, and there's a character. By the way, The Watchmen was inspired by some of objectivism. There's one character in there named Rorschach that's an objectivist, I think. And then there's this other guy, Dr. Manhattan, that uh, through a scientific accident or experiment or something, I haven't watched it, he turns into this godlike being that can fly and that can teleport and just goes to live on Mars for a while because there's nothing in the Earth that interests him anymore. He's disinterested. Okay, so it's an interesting science fiction thought experiment. I don't think that this is applicable to the kind of thing that has a soul, to the kind of thing that has a consciousness. Maybe to a robot, maybe the robot would not have any interest in any events in the world. If the robot could not go out of existence, perhaps there would be no reason for the robot to want to take any action. But we're not talking about robots. So, top of 211, there are no grounds for it to pursue one side of any alternative as against the other. There are no grounds because the fundamental alternative, the value generating alternative, does not apply in this case. I mean, Peikoff is again connecting where values come from to life, but it just seems like an exercise in question begging to me. Just because of the fact that we are goal directed conditional beings and that our values are mapped to that goal pursuit, does it then follow that there would be no values if there was not that fundamental divide between the possibility of living and dying? I don't see why it follows. That's right. He, he says the value generating alternative is, I'm paraphrasing, to be or not to be. But there's another alternative, to gain or not to gain, to thrive or not to thrive. That is why I say that he's dropping the gain concept from value is that which you act to gain or keep. And he's focusing exclusively on the keep aspect, meaning keeping your life to be or not to be, as if there is no alternative in regard to gain or not to gain. So he writes at the top of 211, there are no grounds for it to pursue one side of any alternative against the other. There are no grounds because the fundamental alternative, the value generating alternative, does not apply in its case. There is no to be or not to be. He says, to an indestructible entity, no object can be of value. Bold claim. And then he says, an entity capable of being destroyed and able to prevent it has a need, an interest, if the entity is conscious, a reason to act. The reason is precisely to prevent its destruction to remain in the realm of reality. 
I mean, I agree that there is that need to remain in the realm of reality. There are some points about this, this idea of, you know, something being capable of being destroyed. I accept the idea that if there is nothing either to gain or to not gain, nothing to be destroyed or not destroyed, then the concept of value wouldn't have any meaning. I, I'm open to that. But just as Jacob was pointing out, that doesn't mean that you have to bring in the fundamental alternative of life or death for it to be a concept that's rooted in reality. So in this next section, he says, so it's this ultimate goal that makes all other goals possible. And if you recall on 191, he had pointed out that being a conditional goal-directed entity is the necessary and sufficient condition of values. And that's, I think when we read that, I just said, okay, remember that, because we're going to talk about that later. So he's saying the same thing here, necessary and sufficient. In other words, there could be no values if there were not beings that are goal-directed and conditional. And there must be values because there are. That's the necessary and sufficient. I want to skip then to the top of page 213, and we're basically going to review this material backward. So he asserts here, objectivism says that remaining alive is the goal of values and of all proper action, which is, that's what we've been saying. Uh, and then if you go back a line, the distinctively objectivist viewpoint here, let me repeat, is not that life is a precondition of other values, not that one must remain alive in order to act. This idea is a truism, not a philosophy. So I think we understand that point. You go back in another paragraph, the bottom of page 212, metaphysically life is the only phenomenon that is an end in itself. The concept of value is genetically dependent on and derived from the antecedent concept of life. They might be trying to make this point say more than it really says. Well, sure, there would be no value if there were not life. Sure, life is one of the more fundamental concepts before you can get to the concept of value. Does it follow from that, that life is the only phenomenon that is an end in itself? Does it? The next section is to speak of value as apart from life is worse than a contradiction. It would be a stolen concept. Sure. Yeah, we agree with that. That's not the same as asserting what they're asserting there. Okay, go back a paragraph. An ultimate value, Rand observes, is the end in itself, which sets the standard by which all lesser goals are evaluated. And then she writes, an organism's life is its standard of value. That which furthers its life is the good. That which threatens it is evil. Now, Jacob, do you agree with that idea that the organism's own life should be the standard of value? I think so. But I would want to emphasize that life means more than merely staying alive. That's implicitly denied here in, in what Peacock is saying, because, you know, the, the very last sentence, he says, objectivism says that remaining, remaining alive is the goal of values and of all proper action. Remaining alive. And, and I would want to disagree with that and say, no, remaining alive is not necessarily uh, essential. Thriving is essential to values. I think in light of some other things that I've seen from Peikoff, he actually would agree. I might just propose that his sentence here is sort of like a generalization that needs extra context because elsewhere he's talked about Professor Sidney Hook that was his PhD advisor and talked about the things where he agrees and disagrees with Hook. And one of the things that he agreed with is that it's not life on any terms, but it's life as man. And this is very consistent. If you read through Rand's Objectivist Ethics, it's life as man. And that whole book, The Virtue of Selfishness, it's life as a rational being. If you look at her answer to the question of why is it that John Galt was willing to die if necessary in order to not see someone else tortured, I think that their position is that it's life as man. He just needed in that sentence to add a clarifying remark to that, remaining alive as man, as the goal-directed, rational, long-range entity is the goal of values. Are you tracking with me there? I follow. I still don't think that the remaining alive part is accurate. There's one scenario where acting is necessary in order to remain alive as a man. But then there's another context potentially, where you don't need to act in order to remain alive as a man, but you do need to act in order to thrive as a man. And I want to say that that is what's essential to value, not the former. Because of everything that we've been talking about. The, the, because otherwise, you're saying that the possibility of death 
is essential to the concept of values, which is what Peikoff has been arguing for. Right. Okay, going back in the reading, just another paragraph back, he says, we reached the climax of Ayn Rand's argument, only the alternative of life versus death creates the context for value-oriented action, and it does so only if the entity's end is to preserve its life. By the very nature of value, therefore, any code of values must hold life as the ultimate value. Again, this seems to be somewhat convoluted as a statement, and I think that we could dissect it a little bit. So he says, only the alternative of life versus death creates the context for value-oriented action. Well, within our observations, yes. Under the sun, we don't see any beings that have value-oriented action that are not within that context of life versus death. From that, it doesn't follow that that is the only context in which value could arise. The next little bit is, and it does so only if the entity's end is to preserve its life. And he says, by the very nature of value, therefore, any code of values must uphold life as the ultimate value. Well, the process of living, not necessarily the, the avoidance of death, but the process of living, I would affirm, is the ultimate value. I would make a special term for the desire to live as perhaps being meta-ethical. It sets the entire context, so it is the prime thing that we should value. Yes. And if we're going to make it moral assessments... It is the prime moral assessment. The desire to live is the source of all good. There's a lot in Atlas Shrugged that's on this theme because one of the main characters is James Taggart, and he fundamentally does not have a desire to live. And it's uh, over the series of events in the novel, he comes to realize that, and it breaks him. And then there's another character that gets broken when she comes to realize that that's the way that he lives. He lives without desiring to live. And then there's another character who completely cannot conceptualize the idea that somebody would live without desiring to live. And it's her realization that there are people that are like that, that changes things for her and that it's a major character uh, development step for her. I had something to add right on 212 uh, before mm -hmm. we go on. Having done some of Peacock's online courses, it's just listening to lectures, but I, I do feel like I can read this with a sort of new perspective and I can almost guess what he would say to some of these objections and i can see almost the the wider scope of the error he's making here like you said cody well you know under the sun we see goal-directed action only pertaining to creatures that could die or that could stop living and and so he would say yeah that's exactly right and i only go off of what i have observed i only go off of what i have induced so i'm i you know so i peacock would own that criticism but hold on, because you're going to say anytime someone proposes, okay, well, I believe that there is a, a soul that is immortal. He said, oh, but it wouldn't be able to have values because goal-directed action has to do with beings that can lose their life. He's kind of stepping outside of the context that he used to form that principle. And it's kind of the same mistake that they'll sometimes make with God, where they'll say, well, all consciousness is the consciousness of a physical organism. It's like, okay based on all the examples that you're using to formulate your definition, yes. But then when we introduce arguments for another type of being that isn't physical, you, you're treating it as if you can never have new data. And I think that's the sort of Mott and Bailey, I don't know if it's a Mott and Bailey, but it's, it, it's sort of a refusal to alter their definition here is where you'll get stuck arguing with them if you're a Christian. Maybe we could call it an argument by illicit definition. I think you're absolutely right that it's a Mott and Bailey and that they they use the induction aspect of their epistemology in that vicious way. We can agree with the emphasis on an induction in epistemology when they're using it properly, but they often abuse it when it comes to really anything that challenges their other premises especially when it comes to the supernatural and religious things. It's the exact opposite of what their theory otherwise would lead you to. I think that would be an appeal to ignorance. Yeah. I was going to also say that, Jacob, one time that we had this conversation about this section in the book, you made a distinction between um, the you know, to disagreeing with them that the possibility of death is necessary 
for achieving values. And then I kind of said, well, okay, but but don't we also think that God, you know, permitting the fall was somewhat necessary for him to allow us to conceptualize the full range and full scope of his goodness. So, and you kind of helped me see the distinction between those two ideas, because there would be plenty of values that we could get if death wasn't on the table as a possibility. But if death had never entered creation, there would be certain ones that we couldn't get. So it, it's still true that death, that, that God had a, a, a wider purpose that involved our pursuit of values in allowing death. Because when we look at redemption and mercy, justice, there, there are several different concepts that can only be grasped by human mind if evil is present. And I think Peacock would agree that if evil weren't present, we wouldn't have a concept of justice because you wouldn't have a contrast. You wouldn't be able to contrast justice with injustice or something like that. That's different from saying that death is necessary for all values. Yes, that's right. There are a number of values that we would have even if the fall never occurred and death and evil were not possibilities, but we would not be able to conceptualize as creatures just because of being creatures. We wouldn't be able to conceptualize and fully know what it means for God to be wrathful, for God to have mercy and grace, for God to be wise in defeating an enemy, and and lots of other things along those lines. And the purpose of God allowing evil and the fall in large part is his desire to put those particular attributes on display for us, his creatures. Uh, but you're right, that, that doesn't mean that death as such is necessary for values as such. Well, we go in the reading to the last two paragraphs that I wanted to share with you. This is where he actually makes the argument. And a lot of what was said before was, was simply explaining what his position is, but now arguing for it. We're at the very bottom of 211. So he says, reality is the starting point, and one cannot engage in debates about why one should prefer it to nothing. I think that's reasonable. Then he says, nor can one ask for some more basic value, the pursuit of which validates the decision to remain in reality. I agree with that. The commitment to remain in the realm of that which is, is precisely what cannot be debated. That's a good point. I think that it's not debatable. The way I understand his point here is he is saying that there is a need for validation or debate, and that need only arises within the context of the pursuit of life. So the facts of reality gave rise to the need for things like validating ideas, debating ideas. And so it would be a perversion to then try to debate whether or not you should even be in the context at all. Now, I think that there's something to that argument. Do you guys see what, I'm, what I mean there? Yes, and uh, I want to agree with that and say this is somewhat connected to the classical idea that being is goodness. Yes. In a very specific sense. And that goodness is being. And, and this is why you can get an ought from an is, because isness, reality, is the ground for oughtness or morality. Life is good. I would add, it's not just the decision to remain in being, but the decision or affirmation of being what you are to the fullest extent possible. That's where you get, you know, living as a man, being what you are and thriving to the fullest extent possible because a living being has a telos and that, that telos is part of its being, the aim, the design of a being is part of its being. The oughtness is wrapped up in the nature of the thing. And what's good for that thing is for it to fully realize its being according to its nature. Where does he go wrong when he says the commitment to remain in the realm of that, which is precisely what cannot be debated? Because all debate and all validation takes place within that realm. Where is he going wrong? Like, where, where, where does he slip up in getting to that conclusion, do you think? We agreed with that decision. Oh, okay. Or with that, with, with that point. I see. Yeah, let me read that sentence one more time in light of what Jacob has just said. 
the commitment to remain in the realm of that which is, is precisely what cannot be debated. Jacob and I agree with that. You cannot debate the commitment to live. He says all debate, all validation takes place within that realm, existence, and it rests on that commitment. The process, the need for debating and validating arises only after you already have decided to live. Now, there's uh, one objectivist lecture that I've heard where they talk about there's hierarchically metaphysics, then epistemology, then ethics. But well, I think this might have been a, a Peter Schwartz lecture. I, I don't remember if it was Schwartz or it might have been Benzwinger. They were making this point that unless you already have a commitment to live, you don't need an epistemology. Epistemology, the study of how do you validate your ideas and what is truth, only arises because you are a living being pursuing values. And they had this whole lecture on that point. I thought it was fascinating. But Jacob, this leads me to a question that I've been wanting to ask, which is, does that make it an unchosen obligation? Yes, I think so. The obligation to live, not just to live, not just to survive, but to live as a man, and not just that, but to live as a man to your fullest potential, that obligation is pre-choice because you can choose not to do that, but you still have the obligation to do that. That, that would be what I would affirm. You ought to choose to do that. And then every other ought comes from that choice to do that. I might simply modify the phrasing just very slightly and to say that oughtness means this. There may be something to this. I have to think about it a little bit more. But the, the very idea of saying something ought to do something means speaking about pursuit of life. So that they are so much the same thing they're just different perspectives on that same thing that they cannot be separated. I keep coming back to what is our obligation to God, you know, when we start out before a human being has decided, I want to do whatever it takes to live as a human being, as a man, and try to live to my fullest potential. Before that point, it would seem theologically that he would still have an obligation to God, or that God would be just in exacting some sort of wrath if that person didn't decide that. It'd be interesting to think about that once we have digested all of this, that might be where we get into some real, real differences from Peacock and his associates. Well, real quickly, I would just say for our own edification to conceptualize this, I would say that our obligation to ourselves is the same thing as our obligation to God and in a sense, is also just an obligation to reality. Yeah, to life. Yeah, and to life. So to live as the being that you are is an obligation that you have to yourself, to reality, to God. It's all one and the same thing. And the refusal to do that is an offense, an injustice against yourself, against reality, and against God in all the same ways. All right, so from what you're saying, it strikes me that I should no longer go around saying there are no unchosen obligations because that's, I might just want to make a caveat. There's one. Yes, that's what I would say. I think you persuaded me. All right. So then the next sentence about every concrete within the universe and about every human evaluation of these, one can in some context ask questions or demand proofs in regard to the sum of reality as such. However, there is nothing to do but grasp it is. And then if the fundamental alternative confronts one, Bow one said in a silent amen, amounting to the words, this is where I shall fight to stay. I think we agree with him on this. It's just a question of how do you classify that attitude? I would want to make a new term for it. And I would say that that is not just a moral attitude, but that's the prime or the meta moral attitude. It's somehow in a different category from other moral things. And now going way back to 211, goal-directed entities do not exist in order to pursue values. They pursue values in order to exist. And I'm just going to say, really? I think they exist to pursue values, but also existence and pursuit of values are conceptually difficult to separate from one another. And then he writes, only self-preservation can be an ultimate goal, which serves no end beyond itself. I don't know, because if there's something that is not capable of dying, then it's, then I wouldn't say so. I'd say that the preservation of values, the pursuit, the gain of values is an end in itself. Does that seem right to you, Jacob? Yes. Once again, he's dropping the gain concept from value is that which one acts to gain or keep and, 
and treating keep as the exclusive necessary thing there. I want to respond to this with a quote from John Galt in Atlas Shrugged. Achieving life is not the equivalent of avoiding death. Joy is not the absence of pain. Intelligence is not the absence of stupidity. Light is not the absence of darkness. An entity is not the absence of a non-entity. Existence is not a negation of negatives. There is a similar quote, I'm just going to paraphrase, where he says, you exist for the sake of avoiding punishment. We exist for the sake of earning rewards. It is not death that we wish to escape, but life which we wish to live. What Galt is proclaiming there is that life is more than, abundantly more than, merely not dying. Uh, I would change it from self-preservation to, it's, it's, a, it's a loose term today, so take this with you know a, a certain amount of weight that most people wouldn't use it with, uh, self-actualization. And I don't mean it in the postmodern uh, subjectivist type sense that most people would use it today. I mean it in the sense of there is an objective telos to yourself, to your being. If you're using it in the most objective and reality-based telos-oriented sense, self-actualization would be the better term to use than self-preservation. So then to give Peek off his last word for this reading, philosophically speaking, the essence of self-preservation is accepting the realm of reality. I think he's right. We could also add self-actualization means accepting the realm of reality. I just want to add just from a Christian perspective, for a Christian, would the ultimate value be self-preservation? The ultimate value self-preservation. Well, I, you know, I can't conceive of me choosing like some other value over the idea of me going to heaven and living forever in a state of joy. I can't say I would like to go to hell in order to purchase some other value. I, I actually struggled with this dilemma early in my Christian life, but before I had read Rand and I, I think I had just started reading Piper and a little bit of Edwards, but I hadn't, I hadn't fully grasped it all. I was praying, God be glorified no matter what you have to do to me. And I, I started to pray, even if you have to send me to hell in order for you to be maximally glorified. And then I, I stopped and I thought, wait, the, the whole purpose of me praying that God would be glorified is because I want to enjoy his glory. And, you know, I learned from Piper, at least that God is glorified in me wanting to be wanting to enjoy his glory. But if I'm in hell, I'm not going to enjoy his glory. And so if, if I say God be glorified, even if you have to send me to hell, what I'm saying is, I, I don't value your glory enough to want to see it. And, yep. and so I'm, I'm actually devaluing his glory by praying that he sent me to hell in order to glorify himself. And, and I realized that that's a contradiction. I can't pray that. That's not true. That's not valid. And, and it's, not, it's not honoring to him. And that was sort of the, the rock bottom of my escape from altruism, you know, building the groundwork for me to become and and to affirm christian egoism uh, before i had started the blog and everything was that i want to enjoy god's glory i want to thrive and that glorifies god and and i'm okay with that that is morally good that is morally praiseworthy could i add i think that without the gospel as it actually is presented to us i think you would have to say god i want you to be maximally glorified but you're going to have to send me to hell for that because if there's not the gospel as we have it, God's glorification and your enjoyment of it, I think they might be at odds because yes, you absolutely. know, like, because you would say, I know that I've sinned against you. I want you to be maximally glorified, but I'm also going to have to ask you to treat yourself like a doormat in all these different ways over the course of my life and the lives of everyone that I love and that I also want them to enjoy you too. So God, can you please be a doormat and be maximally glorified? It's almost like, the gospel is, and this is something that I think you guys have said, general revelation can get you to the doorstep of the gospel in that if you can think about your ethics, you can think about the need for something like the gospel. Obviously, you wouldn't know the facts of, of Jesus's life and death and resurrection, but I think that that's worth noting because I think that we should all try to keep the gospel front and center as much as we can in our enjoyment of God. Otherwise, it kind of seems like it's a side issue. 
And Cody, something I wanted to add to your statement was when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment is, he said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the great and first commandment. And he says, and alongside you should love your neighbors yourself, those two commandments on those depend all the law and the prophets. And that's kind of like what you're saying. It's almost like a meta moral statement. Everything depends on that, but it's still a commandment. So I thought that was an interesting parallel. Uh, and maybe we could flesh that out in the future. Great. Well, we should wrap up now because we're running a little long. And I want to remind you what the Westminster Confession says. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And Piper is correct to point out that if there is a chief end, and that is a singular, to glorify God and enjoy him forever, those have to be understood as being compatible with each other. And that's, I think that's a good way to summarize what Jacob was saying about this understanding of the compatibility between our enjoyment of God and God's being glorified. And so Piper would say the the chief end is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. And I would even suggest to us that we could say it is to enjoy God forever by glorifying him. And those two things are just as valid. And so we can agree with where Rand is going in a sense. She, where she is going is that rational egoism is correct as a theory of ethics. And we're going to get there in the coming weeks in our discussion. It's going to be challenging, especially if this is new material to you, but you'll soon understand why at christianintellectual.com we advocate rational Christianity for those who love their lives and why we would identify as rational egoist Christians. And we'll explain what that means and what it doesn't. But by the end, you'll understand what is the purpose of FTNCI? Because our purpose is to speak to the church about these issues. I would say this is my life's fundamental purpose is to help the church understand rational egoism within the context of these other values that objectivism advocates. I want Christians to understand rational egoism because I want them to think that Christianity is rational and I want them to love their lives because that is what the kind of life that God wants for us. That is how God has created us. That is what the Bible teaches. That is what general revelation teaches. And without that foundational piece of being willing to love your own life, you cannot be any good as a Christian philosopher or theologian. You cannot be any good as a father or as a teacher or as a business owner. You cannot be any good as an evangelist or a missionary or preacher. And so we've come to tell these preachers that get this wrong, that it's time to change. That's what we're doing at christianintellectual.com. If you'd like to register, if you'd like to watch our replays, go to christianintellectual.com slash objectivism. And I hope to see you next week at 9 a.m. Eastern on Saturday. God bless.